by world. Okay. Yeah. Tonight's event has is, is brought to us by World Family Forum in partnership with Together People International. Together People International TPI is a global organization dri driven by People Made Solutions Group Company Limited with focus on expanding the chances of individuals, governmental or non-governmental organization through the collaborative pursuit of mutually beneficial goals, which none of them can easily independently achieve. The cardinals at TPI are collaboration, entrepreneurship, education, and culture. And again, we are partnered also by Ant Plants, as we had yesterday, Dr. Yujie, um, we, we had a fruitful discussion yesterday, Ant Plants, takes root in Shanghai and working with various this serves the young, uh, the Yangtze River Delta integration of rural revitalization. Currently operating the pastoral five towns and carries out rural cadre tra uh, training, international youth agricultural innovation training and youth research services. It is a four-in-one entrepreneurial platform providing entrepreneurs with home where dreams set sail, ant nesting, early investment, ant fund, um, in, in internet talent, ant education, and then internet operation talent and IT services educational and then industrial collaborations processing with the Netherlands, Japan and Israel, Germany, France, Italy, and the United States. Again, we are partnered by Next Level Educational Foundation International. Next Level Educational Foundation International. And what do they do? Next Level Educational Foundational International is a global organizational with board members from China, Nigeria, Canada, and the United States of America with a mission to facilitate removal of educational barriers towards optima optimization of human potentials at individual, institutional, community, and country levels. Again, we are partnered also by Organization of African Academic Doctors, OAAD. Who are they? OAAD is an international organization, international nonprofit organization that is open to PhD holders and PhD students of African descent, home and abroad. Members currently subscribe from 54 country, African countries and over 70 countries globally, established as a research implementation and development center. The vision of OAAD is to enhance the quality of life in Africa through research, technology, and innovation. Our mission is doctrine solutions for Africa and the world. And our main objective is to bring Africa intellectuals, African intellectuals together and foster development while engaging relevant inter internal and external stakeholders. Then we have Wasomi Charity Foundation, Wasomi Charity Foundation, WCF, WCF. Wasomi Charity Foundation is also a Pan-African international organization which drives broad-based and strategic development agenda with a core model of facilitating community-based sustainable development to the many grassroots communities of Africa. Over the years, WCF has benefited from the commitment of African elites who see it to who see it as a privilege to be able to use their privileges in pursuit of enhancement of the quality of lives of real everyday people across Africa. 
So these are our partners and we gladly um, acknowledge you all. And once again, we welcome all of you to today, day two. Today is day two and we're going to have interesting topic tonight. But before I come introducing our guest speaker for today, I would like to call on Prof. O.D. Elijah to tell us something. Yeah, over to you, Prof. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Sister Ruth, for the opening, which you've driven beautifully well. Uh, it's a pleasure once again to, I'm really excited to see our brother Stephen, our guest speaker who is already in the house tonight. Uh, welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and also to all of our colleagues who have come on board. It's beautiful to see you all and to know that you've taken our time to, uh, to come on board as we are kicking off this conversation for this uh, evening. And of course, we know very clearly it's an ongoing conversation and we're going to be pushing this forward because of the value we find in it. We are not here to waste our time. We're here because we understand the implications of what's going on in the world around us now, the changes happening, the global grand challenges, and we understand what that's doing to the family setup in the world. We know that if we don't take strong actions, nothing is likely gonna change because people turn things around and indeed families run the world. And knowing the challenges that are going on in the world in connection with the family, the world, the economic systems, the environment, and all the things we care for are likely going to be extinct if the family structure is not maintained and enhanced, strengthened over time. This is why we are gathering with people from all, all around the world, uh, reaching out to diverse forms of uh, partners in the private sector, in government, intergovernmental organizations, and various entities, individuals from around the world, so that we can progress conversations in the space of the family, because we understand what's going on and what's likely going to happen, as mentioned previously. So it's beautiful to know that because of those things that are happening, we have to take extraordinary measures, because as, as Julie said, that desperate times require desperate measures. Uh, this afternoon, I was part of a, a conference uh, where it was emphasized, you know, the, the current scenarios going on in terms of the economic uh, development around the world. And of course, we know that uh, the SDGs are just um, eight years away from the deadline that we fixed for ourselves to achieve various things uh, that are related to the human welfare and human well-being around the world. Many of these have not been attained, but how are they going to be attained? They can only be attained by people who are connected to families, people who are members of families. And if those people are not uh, fully functional the way they should be functioning, if they are not fully stabilized the way they should be, then the difficulties that lie ahead of us will be bigger than we imagine. We know also that at the moment, there are big challenges in terms of balancing work life, family, and experiences of that nature. People who run research understand also these difficulties. And we know that we are at a situation where we have to engage. So please, it's a very huge pleasure and honor to have you in the house tonight, uh, or this afternoon, or this moment, wherever you're joining us from. And we uh, welcome you to relax and participate fully, engage. Uh, and it's beautiful that we have um, an interesting uh, guest in the house tonight. And uh, we can only have a beautiful time. So please welcome once again. And I hand over back to our moderator for the day, the anchor, our sister Ruth. Please over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof, for that brief intro. Yes, um, now we will set the ball rolling um, by introducing our guest speaker. He is in the person of Stephen J. Rancourt, born in Montreal, Canada, 
Steven's first job was working as a cleaner at a restaurant at the age of 12. I'm humbled. He did several jobs in this in his early years before graduating, most of which involved mutual labor, sorry, manual labor. After graduating from the British Columbia Institute of Technology in 2001, he began his career in live broadcasting and multimedia design. Steven moved to Shanghai in 2004, beginning a new life in China. Beginning a new life in China wasn't easy, but fortune played its role and he landed a job with the Shanghai Metro Metrological Bureau in 2008. He has worked for the Shanghai Municipal Government for nearly 15 years and was recently given a Mon Mon Magnolia Silver Award by Shanghai Municipal Office of Foreign Affairs. During his time with the Shanghai Weather Office, Stephen worked as a broadcast meteorologist, but was also responsible for liaising with international de delegations when they visited the city's weather service and forecast offices. He was a lead exhibit, he was a lead exhibit designer for the meteorological pavilion at Expo 2010 Shanghai that's Meteor World, as well as Shanghai Meteorological Museum at Shu, Shu Jiahui, Shu Jiahui, yeah, where he also functioned as its curator. Steven's multimedia and graphic design background was also put to good use as he was tasked with designing a variety of logos, graphical interfaces, and icons the city's uh, emergency pre <clears throat> preparedness platform. Steven now works for Shanghai Media Group, SMG, as on air talent, graphic designer, voiceover narrator, and copy editor. He is married and lives with his wife in the suburbs of Sh Shanghai. Steven now works for, all right, that is the same thing. So um, he is going to speak on the topic traveling but not leaving home traveling but not leaving home this is family world family forum uh, yeah world family forum and we are going to talk about ourselves family traveling but not leaving home what what goes into it what does it take how can you be say you are traveling but you're not leaving home Stephen is going to take us through that research has uh, has shown that it is a regrettable experience to be away and disconnected from one's home, one, one's home country while living abroad, either for studies or for work. This dilemma of living or lo uh, loving to be in touch with home, but having to be more available where one is has been intensified with the protracted pandemic, but something can be done. It's a dilemma. What are we doing? So he's going to take us through that discussion. And if you have any question as he's uh, presenting his, doing his presentation, please prepare your questions, post it on the chat box. I'll gather all of them and then we'll discuss. Gather your questions, post them on the chat box, make use of the chat box and I will, gather all of your questions as he goes, takes us, takes us through his uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And over to you, Stephen. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we're good. These AirPods are working. Yes, we are excellent. good. We can hear you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, uh, I'd like to thank you all for having me, first of all. Uh, I was a little bit, uh, I don't wanna say, flustered, maybe a little bit confused. I felt it was slightly odd when I was um, asked to speak. Um, I'm a lot of things. I have a TV presenter, copywriter, editor, um, even an entrepreneur. I started, started a business this year. Um, but I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a social scientist. Um, so I was a little sheepish about doing this. Uh, family is not something, if I'm being totally honest with everyone, it's not something that I thought about 
you know, too much. They were just there, you know, part of my life. I don't have any children. I, I do have parents. I have siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins. Uh, and my little brother actually has a daughter and a son. So I have a niece and a nephew. Um, but I, like everyone, belong to a family. In fact, two families, one could say, because uh, I am married here in Shanghai. And uh, her family is, uh, they're all Shanghainese, so they're all here. And they've welcomed me into their family. So it's, I, I do have a family here, although it's not the same as the family back home. So we're just going to keep it with the family back home, as that's what we're talking about here. Now, uh, I'm not a, a short timer. I didn't come out to China just to, you know, for some contract. Uh, I didn't come here to study, uh, to get a postdoctoral degree or something like that. Uh, I actually came out here just on vacation and ended up staying because I became so intoxicated with the place. Um, in terms of my relationship with my family back in Canada, uh, I left home at a relatively early age for where I come from. Uh, I was 17 years old when I left home. I didn't go far, mind you. Um, <laughs> I was still able to bring my laundry back to my house to you know, get it done there. But uh, I eventually ended up moving to Vancouver, uh, which is on the other side of the country. Um, it's about a five hour flight, so it's not as far as it is now. Um, but it was still, it took some getting used to uh, having to you know, only contact the family. At this time, there was no you know, FaceTime or Zoom or anything like that. So everything was done by phone call. Um, and back then you had to get calling cards and long distance and all this kind of stuff. So it's obviously a lot more convenient now. Um, in terms of speaking of my own experience, I'm not so uh, ignorant to, to think that um, everything is the same as where I come from. Now, where I come from, things don't change very much. Uh, even when I go back home, everything's pretty much in the same place. Uh, there's just a frightening level of stability, at, at least so far. That's the way it's been. Very, very few things changed. So maybe that's part of the reason I never really uh, worried too much about you know my hometown and my family because I knew as long as they were there, they were fine. It's not a big deal. So um, what it comes down to is keeping in touch with the family for me became uh, sort of more important. My parents are, they're entering their twilight years now. Um, and I'm on the other side of the world and I'm here for the long haul. I'm not going back, um, at least not until I retire, at which point my parents may have already um, passed on. So I'm not completely uh, unaware of the fact that I may only see my parents another 10 times you know, before that's it. You know, you make one trip home a year, possibly two, right? Who knows? Um, obviously, I haven't been back home in quite some time. Uh, the global pandemic has thrown a bit of a spanner in the works in terms of international travel and things like that. So um, I am happy to say that uh, I will be uh, heading back to Canada in October as my mother is uh, turning 70. So uh, that only happens once. So I'm going to head back there. Now, how am I sort of able to be so or how was I able to be so disconnected for such a long time? Um, a lot of that had to do with my sort of upbringing. I changed schools uh, several times during my formative years. Um, so I, I bounced around from different schools. And every time I went to a different school, I made a whole batch of new friends. And I don't wanna say I cut ties with my old friends, but um, basically slowly but surely, we just lost touch. And that habit continued into my twenties. Um, I went on my first big adventure. I, I went to Europe and spent quite some time just riding rails, finding odd jobs and uh, you know doing that. And once again, I left, let all of my friendships sort of just fall by the wayside. Uh, my family was all I had left when I went back to my hometown. And uh, from there, I went to the North of Canada to work in the oil fields for a little while. And uh, when I came down from there, I moved to Vancouver. And that's when I was living on the other side of the country for my parents for the first time. And uh, it, it, it was a challenge at first, but I had already been out of the house for several years before that happened. So it, it wasn't something that uh, impacted me as much as, let's say, an individual who uh, leaves their home for the first time to go abroad and study and goes extremely far away, like halfway around the world. That is a major shock. I managed to get my feet wet and then test the waters before I went farther and farther and farther. 
now I'm at a point where I actually live on the other side of the planet from my family. It is exactly a 12 hour difference, which actually makes, you know, phone calls and stuff like that convenient because it's, you don't have to do any complicated math, right? If it's 1 a.m. here, it's one in the afternoon there. Now, some things are uh, universal. So even though where I come from, everything is just shockingly uh, stable um, and other places may not be that way, there are some things that are universal. That doesn't matter where you're from. Parents take care of children, at which point children take care of their parents. I mean, I think we can all agree with that. That's pretty much the same the world over. And I am now at a point where, uh, as I mentioned, uh, my, my parents are in their twilight years and I have to consider their quality of life and uh, what I need to do to make sure that they're taken care of. Now, I am not alone in this. I have two brothers. Uh, I'm the eldest. And uh, between myself and my two siblings, my parents should be just fine. And my parents have also prepared for their own retirement. So um, they're perfectly capable to support themselves, but they did raise me. And as far as I'm concerned, they deserve more than just living off a pension and constantly trying to decide whether they can afford to buy something. Or, you know, when you're living on a pension, everything has to be sort of planned out and whatnot. But there are unforeseen global situations that could render their savings completely inadequate. Uh, right now, we're seeing runaway inflation, especially on that side of the world. And uh, yeah, this is something that uh, concerns me when I think about my parents. And I'm sure it's something that's concerning my brothers um, as well. In the end, I know I still have two brothers back in Montreal with my parents. So I know no matter what happens, they are not alone. So I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate in that I can be doing what I'm doing on this side of the world, uh, knowing that in a, in a pinch, somebody is there for them and you know they can sort of keep things going until I get back. But um, it is a little bit odd. In terms of staying connected with your family, um, parents are easy. In my experience, at least my parents, it's easy. Um, every parent loves their child. Every parent wants to see their child do well. Every parent wants to revel in their child's successes and, and console them and commiserate with them in terms of anything that may have fallen short. Um, technology certainly makes, certainly makes it easier to stay in touch with your family. Um, but more than that, parents are easy, siblings, not so much. Um, don't get me wrong. I love my brothers and I'm sure they have nothing but good things to say about me, but we just, we don't connect the way that we used to. Um, I have lived abroad for a quarter century, more or less, or sorry, I've lived away from the house for a quarter century. I've been in China for 18 years now. Um, my brothers never left our hometown. So this is very little in common with them, so to speak. Parents don't care. <laughs> If you have anything in common with them or not, they just want to see you and they want to spend time with you. But brothers, and I would assume sisters are, are very much the same. I don't have any sisters, unfortunately, but uh, I can only speak from my own sort of uh, experience. I just don't uh, relate to my brothers the way that I used to. Um, and it's not just them. It's also friends and, and people that I left behind when I first moved to China. Um, when you're living the expat lifestyle in a different country, everything's exciting. Change happens really fast. Everything is new, everything is different. And when you go back home, things change there as well, but not to the extent that you're used to as an expat living abroad. So some of us, or at least I, I can only speak for myself, had a tendency to downplay some of those changes. Uh, so one of my brothers telling me about a new project or something that he started, I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds interesting. But I didn't take an, a real interest in it like I should have. And I think that was part of the disconnect there. Um, also, when you are the one returning member of the family and you only go back once a year or something like that, uh, you end up becoming the center of attention. At, at family gatherings and things like, because you're, you're the, the outsider that has come back. So they get together multiple times a year, um, but I'm only there maybe once a year. And most recently, 
I haven't been back for three years now. Uh, when I go back in October, it will be the first time I see my mother and father since uh, probably August, I believe, of 2019. So, um, yeah, that's going to be a bit of a shock. So what I plan to do on this next trip back is to try to take the focus off myself as best I can and try to get more in touch with my brothers and where they're at. Because as I said, my, my parents are, are getting up there and we're going to have to think about what we're going to do for them sort of going forward. In the, uh, in the I don't know, 15 to 20 years that I, I've been outside of Canada, um, I've made uh, mistakes in terms of keeping in touch with my family. One of those mistakes, as I, I mentioned already, was um, not recognizing that things also change for people over there. When you, when you combine the fact that you're in a different place and everything is always so exciting and new and changing, and then you go home and you become the center of attention, and everybody's asking you about all these things that are also interesting, um, you sort of forget that other people's lives are going on as well. And the changes in their lives are just as significant, even if they don't appear that, uh, that way to you. Um, mistake number two, which is something I'm looking to correct, is using one family member as sort of a as as a hub to the rest of the family, instead of maintaining contact with each individual. Uh, I think that was another reason that uh, my brothers and I have kind of a disconnect is because the only contact I had with my brothers was through my parents. So it was my parents telling me what's new with my brothers. And I'm sure when they meet with my brothers for Sunday dinner, they tell them what's going on with me. But there's no direct contact there. Um, I don't know, maybe this isn't an issue for other people. Maybe they don't have that problem. Maybe the, they have contact with their brother and their sister and all this kind of thing. I, uh, I have a bit of an idiosyncrasy. I absolutely refuse to use Facebook. Um, so that's on me. Uh, I just, I don't like the whole concept. I, I do understand it's a useful tool in that sense, but. It's just not something I'm into. I'm considering uh, purchasing a couple of, uh, you know, mid-range smartphones and loading them with the, the Chinese version of WeChat here and adding my contact and simply just giving them to my brothers so that they can contact me, I can contact that whenever with just a simple push of a button. So hopefully that might end up bridging the gap. But I also, when I go back in October, I plan to... Um, not just stay at my parents' house, but also stay at my brother's apartment downtown and then go and see my other brother who lives out in the suburbs and stay with him and his wife and kids for a while and really touch base with them, not just with my parents. Um, I've lived away from my family for nearly 30 years. And for the longest time, I thought nothing of it. I've lived in Shanghai for 18, as I mentioned, but it... Uh, it wasn't until 10 years in, or maybe even 15 years in, before I realized I had uh, sort of lost touch with where I came from. Um, thankfully, it, in my case, it was just a matter of picking up the phone, because where I come from, frighteningly, shockingly stable, nothing ever changes. The phones are always going to be there. It's, it's not really a problem. It's, it's all on me, basically. So the onus is on me to make sure I stay in touch with them. Um, the pandemic obviously uh, made things a little bit more complicated. The, it, it, well, not more complicated. In a lot of ways, it brought us closer together um, because when it first broke out, obviously my parents were worried about me here. Um, but I remember like just totally disabusing them of any worries they might have about me here and shifting it back and letting them know that they should be worried over there because I knew where I was and how it was going to be handled. And I know where I come from and I know how it's not going to be handled. Um, and that's pretty much the way it went. We were in, in early 2020, I think in Shanghai, we were shut down for two or three weeks, maybe. I, I worked through the whole thing because I was in broadcasting. I was considered an essential service. So I still moved around. Um, but the city was completely, it was a ghost town. Uh, half the city had already left because it was spring festival. They weren't allowed back in. So it was just 
the whole city went quiet for, for two to three weeks. This is early 2020 I'm talking about, not the most recent uh, April and May closure. But I knew then uh, that they were taking this very seriously. And I also know that where I come from, people don't like to listen when you tell them to do things. So I knew that once the pandemic had made its way over to my side of the world, it was not going to be uh, pretty. So basically I flipped it and I, I was worried about my parents and made sure that they were aware of what was going on and ended up calling them a lot more often. And this brought us closer together. Um, this is the longest I've gone without seeing my family. Uh, just to, it'll be just over three years when I go back in October. Uh, touch wood, I do go back in October and uh, nothing else uh, happens to pop up. But uh, I am very much looking forward to it. And I am very much looking to put this new uh, mindset about the importance of family uh, into practice. Uh, I'm sort of, uh, by the time I finished preparing for this, I was, uh, I was, I was actually quite thankful that this opportunity came up because it's not something I probably would have thought of before I went back home. And uh, possibly I might have ended up repeating some of the mistakes that I made um, previously. And uh, this time, um, you know, I hope to mend, mend some fences and make some stronger connections with my brothers, maybe even some of my cousins, my niece and nephew, as well um, as seeing my, uh, my parents. So, yeah, really looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, that's, that's me, uh, Montreal born, nearly 20 years in China, trying to stay connected to his family as best he can. And uh, yeah, I guess that's where I'll leave it. Um, I'm going to focus my energies on staying in touch with my family and not losing touch with where I come from. That's my main goal uh, for this next visit and uh, going forward. So yeah, I... Uh, throw it back over to you, Ruth, if you have anything uh, you want to add to it or any comments that people have, or I'm, I'm, I'm here to talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steven. That was so, so brief. Um, family, yeah, this is a family talk, um, leaving, traveling, but not leaving traveling but not leaving let me see if we have any question in the chat room yeah in, in my case i i came to china just on vacation and ended up staying so my home is here now and my home is here if i take a vacation i go somewhere and i come back here um but there is a part of me that will always be in montreal that's for sure always mm -hmm. thank you so much mm -hmm. yes do we have any question Oh, Kay is wishing your mom happy birthday in <laughs> advance. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kay. Do we have any question, family? Please, if you have a question, you can raise up your hand, make use of the chat box, and we'll sort you out. But mm -hmm. whilst probably people are still thinking about their questions, I have a couple of questions here that some I gathered um, and I would like to ask. Sure. Okay. Okay. Now, the first question is, how best can one keep his or her balance between family concerns, between family whilst um, family concerns far away at home and the grueling academic work abroad? Let's say, let's take students who are married. How, mm. how can one balance? you know, such, and then still keep in touch with the family. Yeah, well, um, I, in, in my case, it's, uh, it's a little different because I, I actually didn't go abroad to study. But it, I think when it comes to when I was studying, I do remember that it was all about allocation of time and, and, and preparation and, and sort of doing your best to uh, keep your day scheduled and, and regimented. And, uh, you know, squeezing in time for a five or 10 minute FaceTime call or phone call um, is probably the best you can do at this point. I mean, whether it needs to be every day or once a week or um, that, I mean, I will leave to uh, each particular individual. But I know that for, for me, there were times where I went months without talking to anybody in my family. Um, 
And it, in the beginning, it didn't really affect me all that much. But eventually, um, I started realizing um, I, I got a bit of a recharge every time I spoke to them. So I just started speaking to them more often. And that really helped. I, I found, um, obviously, in today's world, technology makes things a lot easier. And what I did was basically anytime I am in uh, a, a taxi cab ride that is longer than 10 minutes, I will send a message. <laughs> if it's longer than, if it's late at night, because here, remember where I'm from, um, we're 12 hours difference. So when I'm coming home from work, sometimes uh, it's about a 30 minute, 30 minute car ride um, from the TV studio back to my home here in the suburbs. I will often just FaceTime with my mother in the, in the car on the way back because it's, it's 9 a.m. there, it's 9 p.m. here. So it's about finding those, those sort of, um, what's the word? In my case, it was about finding the, uh, the moments when you're normally quite possibly doing nothing um, and then taking advantage of that time in order to sort of at least reach out to a family member and let them know that you're thinking of them. Hmm. Okay, in your presentation, you made mention of um, parents taking care of their children, and then children also growing up to take care of their parents. This, this is actually um, culturally um, global, everywhere. Yeah, universal, every yeah. Is. So in your case, how do you uh, maintain that taking care of your, your parents whilst you are away from them? How do you do that to keep that bond, that family ah. bond? Well, like once again, this is where I am uh, very, very fortunate in that I have two brothers um, and both of them are still in Montreal. So I know deep down, no matter what, someone is there for my parents, should anything happen. Um, that would give me time to be able to uh, fly back or, or, or do whatever. Uh, where I'm from, parents do not, uh, they're, they're not reliant on their children. When I say, you know, uh, parents take care of children and then children take care of parents, that's, that is a cultural uh, universal trait, that is for sure. But in, yeah. in different parts of the world, it means different things. In some places, yeah. this is a, a financial responsibility. In other places, it's more of a, um, it's more of a familial sort of responsibility, a duty as it were. Um, my parents are, are, are fine in that they prepared for their retirement. They have savings, they have a pension, they have everything they could possibly need. However, what, what's, the, what's the saying? It's like, um, if, if you wanna make the universe laugh, tell it your plans, right? So, uh, you know, there are unforeseen things that could happen. For example, this runaway inflation that's going on, on back in, on my parents' side of the world. Um, if this goes too far, sinks into a, a massive recession, this could end up impacting um, the amount of, of savings they have put away and the pension payment in order for them to continue to live comfortably in their, in their uh, golden years. Um, thankfully, I, I have a brother who's done very well um, and uh, he's actually more than capable on the financial end of being able to take care of that kind of stuff. So that's good. Um, I don't feel any need uh, to, at this point, I don't feel any necessary, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? My parents aren't looking for me to be able to take care of them. If I do it, it's because I want to, and I'm sure they'll be happy with it. But uh, they did come out here to China to visit me once and had a great time, but I, I highly doubt my, <laughs> My 75-year-old father will want to relocate to Shanghai for, for the remainder of his years. I don't yeah. see him learning Mandarin at age 35. It's just, uh, no, not going to happen. No. I'm sure he'd have some fun, and I'm sure he'd make some friends, but um, yeah, that's just not going to happen. Now, my life is here now, um, so I, I'm not in a position where I'm able to just rip everything up from here and take it back to Montreal and set up there and be with my parents for their, their final years and then come back here again. Um, I have started a business this year. So if that business does really well, who knows what the next five years will hold. 
I might be able to do just that. Um, and if I were able to do just that, I would, I would consider it. Um, but for me, it's more about just uh, being there and seeing them as much as possible. So I'm looking to go back in October and I'm going to try to make uh, twice annual trips if possible um, going forward, just so I can see them as many times as I can before I eventually end up, uh, unfortunately, like, like all parents do, they have to make room for their children and, and they pass on and, and that will be sad, but it is a part of life and um, it's something I'll have to deal with when that comes about. But then there's also that if my only contact with my brothers was through my parents and then my parents are gone, does that mean my connection with my brothers is gone? Right? That, that's another thing you have to sort of consider that whole dynamic changes at that point. It, I'm sure it sounds somewhat selfish explaining it that way, but um, you know, I don't want to lose touch with my brothers. Um, and that's why it's when I was preparing for this, it's something that just got on my mind about how my the only contact I have with my brothers is through my parents and that's wrong so I want to change that and in terms of taking care of my parents I think making sure that they are taken care of is the what I can do from here and I think maintaining proper regular contact with my brothers is probably the best way to do that because you know they say a, a parent is only as happy as their saddest child and my parents will not say anything if anything is going on over there that I don't know about, my parents will be the last person to tell me, right? They don't want me to worry. They don't want me to this. They don't want me to that. They don't want me to think about, you know, the, the bad thing that's going on. So they'll basically just hide it until they can't hide it anymore because that's how they are. But if I'm in contact directly with my brothers on a more regular basis, I'll get the full story and not the, the parental filter that my mother or father will throw up. Nah, don't worry about us, son. We're okay. It's like, uh, no, dad, you got arthritis. You're not okay. You know? So it's, it's a matter of just making sure that, uh, I keep in touch with my brothers as best as possible to know what's really going on with my parents. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for that. In your case, I, your case is not all about money. It's about the, no, the bond is about the bonding like the mm -hmm. personal connection that you need to look at yeah and as you said we are different coming from different backgrounds so our cases may be different some depend on mm -hmm. like cases are money issue financial issue and all that in the case where it is financial issue what should that person do should that person constantly send money? Would that money that he or she sends home uh, kind of keep the, the connection between them as a family? Um, well, I mean, obviously, you, you, people need means to survive. And if the only way, you know, I, I know that in a lot of situations, when uh, one individual travels to the other side of the world in order to, uh, to study or even possibly to work, um, the opportunity is, is, is a great one. And they're, they're most likely in a position where they can really benefit their family. Um, and I think in that case, if, if you feel that it, if you feel that it is necessary to send money back home in order for your family, um, to make ends meet, then by all means, you know, absolutely. Um, the family unit is extremely important and it's something that should be protected. So I think that if you can, if you can do something to help your family, then you, you, you should, I think is, is the best way to put it. Um, I fortunately don't need to worry about that, but a lot of people do. And, uh, I understand that could be very, very challenging, especially if you've started a family of your own abroad. Now you've got a family, an immediate family that you need to take care of. And then you have the family back home who also requires assistance. So that could be twice as challenging. Um, but these are all things that one would need to consider before uh, sort of regularly just sending money um, back home. Also, uh, you know, you want to know, you want to be very, very aware of the situation back home if you're going to be doing that kind of thing. I have certain uncles, for example, I would never send money to <laughs> because I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what they do with it. Um, and uh, 
That's that's not that's not what I would that's not what I would call money, money well spent. Um, so yeah, I'm getting a little feedback here. So. Right. Okay, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. I yeah, Mustafa is saying that. Okay, yes, please keep your questions coming. Mustafa wants to he he acknowledge the fact that he's happy that you have changed your style to be in touch with everyone in your family instead of mm -hmm. one person that will be be the only center of uh, contact but how do you manage the pressure of come back home we want to see you as some families do ask people that stayed long to be back mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. do you cope with that yeah uh i uh, how can i put this <laughs> the it's funny he mentions that because i did used to get that a lot and then my i'm the i'm the eldest firstborn son um in in some cultures that entitles me to or not, maybe not entitles but that basically puts me in a position where i i am duty bound to take care of my parents um yeah. but it, where i come from that's not really the case um uh, it's uh it actually fell to my younger brother. He's about a year, a year and three months younger than me. We were treated like twins our entire lives growing up for the most part. I don't remember not having a younger brother, even though I was just about a year older than him. Um, he got married and had two children. And the minute my parents had grandbabies, they stopped worrying about me. <laughs> it gave them something to focus on. Um, but how would somebody manage that type of pressure? I know it's hard, um, especially if you're if you're over here studying, right? You're over here for a very very specific reason to get something done, and I would assume the plan is to go back home or to move on to another place um, and put what you have learned or put your education to work in order to uh, sort of make money and improve your standard of living and maybe the rest of the family as well. But um, yeah, it, it is tough. It is really, really tough. Um, I know my, my parents didn't really, they stopped bothering me about this when I, when I started making regular annual trips back home, sometimes, uh, sometimes twice a year. Um, I was again, fortunate in that I seem to be a very fortunate person. Um, I, my, my wife was a flight attendant with KLM. My father is a retired Air Canada maintenance crew. So getting on flights is relatively, or was relatively easy for a very long time. So if I wanted to go back home, I had picked up the phone, they gave me a code, I went to the airport, there was an empty seat, I got on the plane, I flew home, no big deal. Um, but uh, in some cases you just can't. So maybe stepping up the frequency of communication might help with that, I don't know. It really depends on an individual basis as to um, you know, how, how close you were to begin with. Um, again, my situation is different from a person who left their hometown specifically to go to another place to study and has been gone for what was supposed to be six months or nine months. And then, you know, global pandemic, travel restrictions, all kinds of things. That six, nine months now becomes two years. Um, that can be a lot for parents to bear, especially if they only have one child. You know, it could be extremely, I could see how that could, I could see how those parents would pressure their child to come back so they really, really want to see them. You could invite them to come and see you. I, I, I used to use that ploy all the time until my parents finally said, okay, and then they came out, um, which was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, I think Maybe it's, it's all about sort of understanding and letting them know that you really want to see them as well. It's just in this particular situation, it's just not feasible um, for that to happen. But you could sort of maybe offer them, you know, the, by, by spending more time with them on the phone or, 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 or on a FaceTime call or, or talking about something completely irrelevant, just as if you were sitting in, in your in your dining room or in your living room back home, instead of the conversation on the phone while you are in Asia and they're in, in Europe or in Africa or in, in Canada or the United States, South America, what have you. Um, don't talk to each other as if you're on different sides of the world. 
talk to each other as if you're sitting in the same room. Maybe that will help sort of bring that. I know with me, when I stepped up the frequency of talking to my mother, mostly is who I talk to on the phone. Uh, my father spends a lot of time out of the house. He's retired. He likes to go puttering around and fixing neighbor's cars and stuff. So, but uh, when I stepped up the frequency of conversations with my mother, the, the conversations became just so banal. They were conversations about absolutely nothing. It's the type of thing you would talk about if you were, you know, uh, still living in the same house, so to speak. Uh, oh. And that really sort of bridged that gap. And then also we don't really feel like we're in different parts of the planet anymore. You know, so that, that I think that worked for me. I don't know if it'll work for everybody, but it definitely worked for me. Definitely it'll work for you, but not everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Give it a shot is all I'm saying. Give it a try. <laughs> it, it might work. It might work. Anyways, no yeah. promises. No promises. Um, yeah. And it's not a there perfect another... solution. It's not a perfect question? solution, but it, yeah. Yes. Yeah, there is another question. Mm -hmm. Was it easy? Was it easier before to travel back and forth between your country and China than nowadays? This is from Kay. There's a follow up. There are follow up questions that I want to take them mm -hmm. one by one. So those are the oh, okay. first question. Was uh -huh. it uh, yeah before to travel back and forth between your country and China than nowadays? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, in that uh, there were multiple flights. Obviously, there were a lot more flights uh, just you know, two, three years ago than there are now. Um, there aren't as many planes, they're not traveling with as much frequency um, and the ticket prices have gotten a lot higher in some cases. If you, if you try to book a short-term flight to Montreal, Canada now from Shanghai, it will probably cost you like, I guess the equivalent of know, four and a half to 5,000 US dollars one way. That's short term, if you try to book a flight for next week or, or in the next two weeks or so. If you book well ahead of time, if you book well ahead of time, like if I wanted to book a flight, I, I'm, I'm looking to go back in October, for example, um, the time to book it would be two weeks ago, maybe even a month ago would have been better. Because um, then the, 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 the fare is almost the same as it used to be, but you need to book well ahead of time. Um, for the longest time, there was no direct flight from Shanghai to Montreal. You, you couldn't do it direct. You had to fly either Shanghai, Vancouver or uh, Shanghai, Toronto, and then change planes and then, and then go on to Montreal. I know it sounds like a real first world problem, but um, after when you're in a sitting in a plane for the, the flight to Toronto from Shanghai is about 12, 13 hours. And the last thing you want to do after being on a plane for 12 or 13 hours is getting off a plane and then getting on to another plane for another hour or so. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's not the biggest deal. It's, it's just a little extra travel. But now there is a direct flight, Shanghai, Montreal. That makes things a lot easier in that, you know, you get on the plane, you get off the plane, you're there. It's a lot simpler. Um, and my father is a retired Air Canada employee. So as his son, I am entitled to some of the benefits uh, from that. And as my father worked for them until retirement, his benefits are sort of grandfathered into his pension. So uh, I may fly using the, uh, the Zedfair or the locator number system for employees. Um, and that, that makes things a lot easier in terms, of, in terms of going home. My biggest problem now, or at least my biggest problem during the last uh, year or so was I wanted to go back to Canada in uh, 2021, but uh, the, the quarantine was just so long. I, I can't, you know, I can't take a month and a half off of work in order to spend, you know, two weeks in Canada. It's just not possible. I would have had to do quarantine arrival in Canada and then to done quarantine again when I arrived in China. And uh, unless you're, you own your own company, Nobody is really able to take that much time off of work or school, for that matter, uh, to be able to um, manage that going back and forth, back and forth constantly. Uh, it was a lot easier to go back and forth then because there's no quarantine and there's more frequency of flights. It's a 
a little bit easier now in that there's a direct flight, um, but the frequency isn't as high. I would, uh, I would say it was easier then than it is now, personally, just with the dealing with the quarantine and travel restrictions and stuff like that. It, it was certainly easier before, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, it was, it was a lot easier to, to fly around, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you so much. And the follow-up question go, is like, um, after this, now that um, you know we have pandemic, COVID pandemic, trying to impede on making like traveling so much uh, cumbersome, will you mm. advise or encourage your family members to visit you now that we have uh, Shanghai, Vancouver, direct flight? Mm -hmm. Will you ever encourage your family members could it be your uncles, your nephews, your nieces mm -hmm. to pay you a visit, let alone to advise them to settle down in China? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'd advise them to settle down, um, but um, the, the invitation to visit is, is, is always open. Every time I go back, I make that clear to everyone that I see while I'm there. Uh, my niece and nephew are still too young to, to make that sort of trip on their own, but they know that they're welcome. If, if you know, like even if just uh, my, my sister-in-law, my brother's wife, she wants to bring one of the kids out, that's totally fine, you know? No problem with that at all, absolutely. Um, moving from Canada to China, it's, it's, when I did it, Shanghai was a very different place than what it is now. Shanghai of 2004 is not the Shanghai of 2022. Um, very, very different kind of city, very different vibe. It's in many ways better. Uh, in some ways, it, it's not as exciting as it was when I first moved here, but that probably has a lot to do with the fact that I have lived here for 18 years. So it's not as shiny, I guess is the best way to put it. It's not as shiny as it was when I first moved here. Um, but uh, I certainly love it here. The city has been nothing but good to me. And I would recommend, I, and I do recommend often, come on over, you know? And, and to be honest, when my family comes or anybody I know comes to Shanghai, the first thing I want to do is take them to another city. Because I'm not a big fan of playing tour guide. Right? I, would much rather, I would much rather be on tour with them than be responsible for their tour. <laughs> so, you know, land in Shanghai, we'll take a train to Hangzhou, we'll take a train to Beijing, we'll go out to, you know, we'll go to some other city, we'll check some other stuff out. Let's go down to Hong Kong, let's go to Shenzhen, let's check out Guangzhou, let's move around. Um, you know, it, it's, because uh, again, for me, living here for 18 years, I'm, I'm adept at getting around, I, I don't have problems, you know, getting uh, whether it's daily life stuff, uh, ordering food, having a problem with a fare, getting into a taxi. I'm just, that's, I don't have any issues here anymore in, in that sense. Um, so going to another city in China is very similar, although I do probably have a, an accent they're not accustomed to if I'm in a different city. But um, it, uh, yeah, they are always welcome to come out. I had one cousin come out to visit uh, she was, she was working for a Danish bank and she came to Shanghai for a convention. And while she was here, she came to see me and, and spent, uh, spent a week, uh, staying with me, uh, in, uh, in downtown Shanghai. And, uh, that was all right. That was fun. Um, even though I hate playing tour guide, she was very, very, uh, you know, she had things to do during the day with the trade show and stuff. Um, and then the, the following week, we just, uh, I would go to work, I'd come home, we'd go out to a restaurant, get a bite to eat, check out the city. Again, this was all pre-pandemic, mind you. This was all before, uh, you know, 2020. Things were uh, very different back then. Thank you so much for that. Um, mm -hmm. that is, uh, yeah, let's read two more questions to go to sure. or three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, one wants to know, is it worth it? Is it really worth it, worth the sacrifice for a family man or woman to leave his or her spouse and children to leave or work or study abroad? Mm -hmm. If really mm -hmm. we want to keep and perpetuate the family unit, is it really mm -hmm. worth 
Well, with it. Uh, I do not have children of my own, so I can't really speak to that end of things. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that, you know, it. I would imagine since as long as there have been families, there have been situations where one person had to leave a family in order to, to provide sustenance in order to benefit the family. So I think it's really, it needs to be treated sort of a case by case situation where um, I don't know if balance is, is what you wanna be looking for in that situation. You know, you might mm -hmm. wanna be shifting the balance in, in, in a way that benefits your family, so to speak. Um, so if you know your reason for leaving is in order to benefit the family, then I think that's a noble cost. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if there is really a way to achieve a perfect balance there. I would instead try to tip the scales of that balance in the favor of the family and make the sacrifice worth it if a sacrifice has to be made. Hmm. But supposing there are children. Mm. That certainly does complicate things. That certainly does complicate things. I think uh, I, I grew up in a, in a very nuclear family. Um, so, you know, mother, father, that whole thing. Sometimes my mother worked. Usually she was at home. It's funny. I, I, I think I was well into my teens before I realized that my mother worked so much harder than my father. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my father... He just, he'd just get up, he'd go to work and he'd come home and he'd get up and he'd go to work and he'd come home. My mother had to raise three boys, right? Three boys. She had to feed three boys three times a day. She had to take care of all their clothes, drive them to hockey practice, football practice, drive them to swimming practice, make sure that their schoolwork was done. That, that, that was all my mother. She did all that. All my father had to do was get up, get in a car, drive to the plant, work, drive home. That was it, you know? So it, it just shocked me. I always thought of my father as the working person and my mother is the, but my mother worked way harder than my father did. But again, I don't have kids and everybody I know that does have kids, uh, those kids are their universe and everything they do is for those kids. You know, the, the minute you have a child, your life isn't yours anymore. Your life is, it's all about making the best world possible for your child. That's the point. Um, and yeah, I think the, the best scenario is if you're going to travel and you have children, try to bring them along, right? Try to bring them with you if you can. I know that's, that's again, coming from me, any, any statement I make is to my ears is going to sound sort of ignorant because I can't really speak on that subject, not having any children. Um, but yeah, I can see that as a, as a major, major issue for people who have to travel for work or for school and they have children. And it's, I think it, it, it dictates how long you can stay away, more or less. You know, a child needs his mother, a child needs their father. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously staying in touch is all that much more important when children are involved. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for the conversation. It's so interesting. And I don't know if we still have some questions popping up. Family, please um, don't be left out. Don't keep your questions <laughs> within you. Keep them coming. Yes, keep them coming. Yes, mm -hmm. Kay, just, okay. Yeah. She says, when it comes to leaving family behind to go, to, to go abroad, the most important thing is to find the right balance that favors mm -hmm. the family it should yeah. always be about family no matter what the final decision is it's all about what is best for your family thank you Stephen. so if Certainly. leaving your family you think is best that is the best decision you you are making then you go for it so it, it boils yeah. down to individual families and then individual spouses and the decision sure that fits them yeah sure sure and, uh, and i think that the what i was getting at was basically is that when when the question is posed how does one find balance between hmm. you know choosing to leave family and the benefit of leaving and all that kind of thing my my thing is yeah the don't we shouldn't be looking for for an equal balance there we should be looking the only reason you should leave is if it's going to 
shift that balance in favor of the family in that sense. Otherwise, right. why are you doing it? Yeah, agreed. Thank you so much. And then mm -hmm. um, looking at our, even before our dispensation, thanks to technology, um, all we got to do is to make very good use of technology and keep our families in touch. No mm -hmm. matter the distance, we need to utilize technology by constant calling, checking up, texting, and video calls most often, especially when it involves children. I, yeah. for once, I have two children, and <laughs> whenever I, I want to speak with my children, I, I, I need to see them. So video call goes with me most of the time. And it sure. makes the children also feel, oh, my mommy, even though she's not here in person, we mm -hmm. always see her and mm -hmm. it keeps that bond in their mind. But if you, you keep away, even though technology is abound and then you don't make use of it, um, you are doing yourself a great, a great disservice. So let's mm -hmm. all, as family as we are, we need to make good use of technology as well. Let's provide our family members with good phones, good network that we can get in touch with them mm -hmm. all the time. Thank you so much, it, Steven. Not a problem. Thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. and the great presentation. I don't know if this is a question. What are some tips? Okay, let me see. What are some tips that could, oh, what? Uh, what are some tips that you could give to newbies in China? Uh, Shanghai to make their integration easier and faster in this new country. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I always I found that uh, China is an incredibly sort of friendly place. Um, just put yourself out there. Just be outgoing. You'd be surprised. Um, you know, you, you go into a restaurant and you try to order something. You know, just. It, it, the language is everything here too. Like you need to learn how to at least get through some of the stuff in, in Mandarin. And I realized that it is a very different language compared to uh, at least English or any European or um, spoken sort of language. It's, 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 the grammar is dead simple. So it's not that hard. It's just the pronunciation that's tricky, but you will find that people are more than willing to help you, at least in Shanghai. Um, there's always someone who's willing to sort of help you out if, you, if you're trying to or get a taxi or trying to order food or having difficulty with something. There's always someone there that's willing to lend a hand, which is great. Just don't be shy, I guess is the best way to put it. The expat community in Shanghai is very vast, very, very large. So, you know, um, just, yeah, put yourself out there, go out, meet people, have a great time. That's what this city was about uh, and hopefully will be about again soon. Um, obviously, things kind of shut down for a little while there. But uh, uh, for those of you who have been in Shanghai as long as I have, you remember, you, you know what this city is capable of. It's, it's a great place to live. And um, yeah, there's, there's always something to do, always a new person to meet. So yeah, just, just put yourself out there. Um, and uh, don't be afraid, whether, even whether it's other, other like non-Chinese or locals the vast majority of people here are friendly and willing, willing to give you the time of day um, if you need help with something. So yeah, don't be shy. Okay, thank you so much for hammering on that. Mm -hmm. Be local, mm -hmm. go out there, relate to the people because uh, yeah. our first speaker yesterday spoke about this as well. Be ah. local, but think global and then mm. put yourself in the language and then learn the language as well. We have Yusuf. I think he wants to ask a question. Yeah, please okay. go ahead with the question. The, the platform is yours. Yusuf Fadayo. Yes, good evening. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yeah, please. I hear you. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, mine, is, mine is not a question. I just want to uh, say thank you to uh, Stephen because um, your presentation has been very engaging and I've learned a lot. What really stood out for me is uh, the part where you said that one should not depend on one family member uh, uh, in order to contact with others. 
you know, it's really struck me because uh, it got me thinking. Because I found out that I've been doing, I've been doing that a lot lately. Because uh, it's an easy I, thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, I, I come from a very from an extended family, and there are some of my family member, immediate family members that I've not spoken to in months. You know, so now that you said it, it just kind of wow. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that's what yeah. I it's want clutch. To it's it's thank clutch. So it's it's important. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. Any more contribution, um, testimony, <laughs> addition, <laughs> takeaways, please. Any more hands up, or you would like to type? Okay, 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 okay. I guess we do not have questions to ask. So I will give the platform to Prof. Odi. I believe he has something to tell us. Maybe your, your platform is yours. Okay. okay. Someone talking? Is it someone is talking? No, I think he's playing a recording. Uh, okay. I, it was a playback of a recording I was hearing there for a second. Okay, oh. I think the person just muted. Please mm -hmm. go okay. ahead, Odi. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's really, uh, thank you so much again, um, Stephen, for the very, very beautiful uh, presentation. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, if it's possible, we'll find a way to transcribe your presentation and um, you know have it printed and go over Otter. it again yeah so it's very rich. yes there's, so you... a, there's an app there's an app called otter o t t o r okay fantastic transcription you just plug the video in it spits the text out oh wow. beautiful perfect oh, beautiful. yeah beautiful beautiful we'll, uh, we'll work around that and get get that done that's really beautiful sure. because uh, many of the statements you made uh, you know are uh, things one should hear over and over again. Sure. And we would want to have um, several other people who are not in this meeting and who may prefer to have some print, would like to have them um, have this. And of course, we have it recorded and we will uh, also spread it across other platforms. Yes, okay. so, that, um, uh, so thank you so much once again. Not a problem, my friend. Yes, and ladies and gentlemen, it's... Um, uh, a beautiful thing that he has been able to share these things with us. And uh, one of the things uh, I may want to uh, emphasize that by my own experience, there are several barriers that would prevent one from, you know, keeping in touch with um, family back home. And I think it's, it, it's a point that may be good for us to to talk about. So if you if there are some barriers you have experienced that may possibly prevented you from uh, keeping in touch with family the way you would want, uh, we could share thoughts about that and then share what you're currently doing to overcome such barriers. And that may just be a very good thing, a very good learning for some persons here uh, because um, uh, Again, I, I just like um, uh, what um, Stephen was saying, it's, it's really useful, you know, using these practical experiences because um, th th those will help people. And he kept saying you know, things he, ha he, he had to begin to do while he was going through the process of preparing for the, uh, for the uh, event. And I would say that that's a huge evidence that we can hold at the World Family Forum that this has that this event has been a very uh, successful one, because what we want to do is we want to be able to see minds changed, we want to be able to see uh, behaviors changed, we want to be able to see attitudes change, uh, bending towards family, because because indeed that's really. Uh, what we can hold, memories, things we can hold beyond, um, beyond several family members who leave, you know, like parents, definitely every parent would want to die before their children uh, in, in every culture. 
I think most coaches, I've not heard of any culture where parents want to live longer than their <laughs> children. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so if there are barriers, what are the barriers? Are there barriers you're facing at the moment? And I'm asking this now to the audience, not necessarily to, um, to Stephen, but uh, to the audience. Let's talk. What are the barriers you're facing uh, the, the, that's stopping you from, from keeping in touch with family? Maybe there is something the World Family Forum may be able to do or something we'll be able to focus on in the future to say this is something that we've found from our engagements that it's a barrier and uh, what can the world do about this? Or we'll be, we'll be able to reach out to certain um, world organizations or country level organizations to let them know that this is what's happening to your citizens. What can you do about it? Uh, you know, I think this has been particularly effective in engaging, you know, around several global grand challenges around the world. Uh, one organization comes up and is able to bring attention to it and something gets done. So I think this is something we may be able to do something about. So please, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Uh, the, the platform is open. You may unmute yourself. You may indicate you want to talk or um, whatsoever. So please, I hand it over back to... Um, our sister Ruth, but I'll hang around just here uh, so that if there's any uh, contribution I may be able to uh, give, uh, let, let, let um, Stephen not feel uh, lonely, staying on the spotlight. Let me hang around with you. <laughs> okay, I think there is one contribution in the chat box from Sister Kay. She's saying barrier, barrier number one, the need to always use a VPN to access foreign social media. This barrier makes things much difficult for experts to keep in touch with family back home. So, yeah, they use yeah, a VPN. Well, when, when my parents came to visit in China back in uh, almost 10 years ago, I think it was 2013, um, we installed Chinese WeChat on their phone. So no problems with the communication now between myself and my parents um, the <clears throat> using the WeChat system because they downloaded WeChat in China, the version that they have is the Chinese uh, WeChat. So we don't have any issues on the connectivity front. It's, it's not a problem at all. And I plan on doing this with my, with my brothers as well, but obviously they're not here. So um, I think just pick up a couple of mid-range mobile phones here and uh, load Chinese WeChat onto them, bring them back to Canada with me. And then there will be a way for them to contact me whenever they want, a way for me to contact them whenever I want. And then we can increase the connectivity uh, between all of us in that sense. Mm, that, 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 that's really beautiful. Yeah, because uh, you, you really uh, mentioned something that can solve it. Because mm. we, uh, my experience now is I have tried repeatedly to help uh, family members back home get on WeChat. Yeah. It's, it, it seems like it's, it's an impossible thing these days. It's, it, they're, they're different spheres. Um, and uh, Basically, the activation is tied to because with reach with WeChat, uh, you need to have a real in-person ID, right? So you can't just get a WeChat account. You sort of need to have an account number and all this kind of stuff. So the plan for me basically is I will use my own. It will be my WeChat account on that phone that they will use basically. And I, I, I will be very clear with them and say, hey, just you only use that to call me, right? You don't. Don't be, don't be putting weird stuff in the moments. Don't be doing anything. Just, just use it for phone calls, right? <laughs> um, because yeah, it is, it is sort of tricky. If you download WeChat in a foreign country, it's, it's almost not the same program. It's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it's downloaded here and, in China. And it, it, it doesn't log you off when they are on. It doesn't log, log you off uh, on a different device. No, if it's, device, a, different, if it's two, a different number. It's a different phone number. You, you should be able to have both accounts oh, okay. running at the same time. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. But you're only allowed a maximum of two. You're only allowed a maximum of two, right? Yeah, so that yeah, third yeah. one is, yeah. I, I don't know how I'm going to get that. I'll, I don't know. Like <laughs> borrow my neighbor's 10 year old daughter's 
ID card or something. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I'll figure something out. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, th this solves the problem for me. I think I'm going to get that for my parents uh, yeah. right right away as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It does mm. look, again, they're only going to use that phone mm. to, to, to video call you on WeChat. That's mm. it. So it doesn't need to be a fantastic, it doesn't have to be like an iPhone 14 or anything like that. You know, it just needs to be, it just needs to be a phone with, with, a, with a front facing camera and a decent screen. And, and that's, that's all it needs to be. You know, you can get a very, very, this is China. You can get a cheap mobile smartphone here. They're not that expensive. It's effective. It's effective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it works. It works. Great. Great. Okay. Great. I think we do not have, People don't want to talk. Oh, I should start mentioning them. What's, what's their take on this mm -hmm. today's program? What's their take? Let me let me start doing something here. We, we, can, we, can, still, we can still deal with barriers. Maybe there may be other ones. Like I've just learned something very practical about this. Mm -hmm. This is practical and I'm going to implement. And I guess some other persons will implement too. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, let's see. Let's see a suggestion. Mm. from our audience about the barriers as well. So I would like to call on Abdul Rauf. Abdul Rauf. What, what's your take on the barriers? What's your take on the barriers? You can unmute yourself and let's hear from you. Yes, let me help you. Maybe another Abdul, barrier. Yeah, probably a different one. Mm. <laughs> Abdul, are you here with us? It's, Someone it's, is saying, can we say the time difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah, countries is also time difference. Yeah. Definitely. For me, for me, so, the math is very easy. Shanghai is here. Montreal is here. So it's mm -hmm. exactly 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So I'm never oh, okay. doing math in my head trying to figure out. Oh, this is well, sorry. Oh, they do. Yeah, they still do daylight question. savings. They still yeah. do daylight savings. So sometimes it's 12 hours. Sometimes it's 13. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw Richard hand on. Richard, uh, I saw one Richard hand on. Is it gone? Yes, hello. Hey, yes, we got Richard. Let's hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I put up my hand to talk about the time difference, but once it's been spoken about, I wonder if you oh. permit me try and shift it a bit um, with a different uh, question. Now, um, one of the challenges I was facing, or I realized being here, is that um, trying to, I feel that my family, that there is um, gradually being a disconnect, you know, between, for example, the kids, my wife, and myself. And the reason. Mm -hmm basically is the time difference because the time that I am up you know they are basically sleeping and when they are up to my wife has to go to work kids have to go to school by the time they come it's almost 12 a.m 1 a.m here I have to sleep you know mm -hmm. so that is it but aside that, um, especially with the kids, I had a conversation with a friend and told him that I'm always thinking about this, this thing because it's like fathers would always say, oh, I'm trying so hard for the family. But at the end of the day, we find that when, we, when fathers grow old, the kids tend to be much more with the mom than the kids, I, I, with, 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 with the dad. For example, I have seen it several times from my grandparents to other parents, even I'm, I think I'm seeing it in my life. And it is like this, that usually when there are occasions, oh, the kids will buy something very nice for their mom. It gets to the dad, they'll buy a towel or a singlet, you know? And my, my, my thing is, I don't want that. I, I don't want that. I'm not saying the kids to buy me, you know, something big, but I don't want that. I think it's a disconnect. And what I am realizing is some of these things that fathers, especially 
in their bid to find something for the family, in their bid to make the family better, probably financially, tend to disconnect from the kids. And that really creates the barrier. And as, as you know, Steve uh, uh, pointed out with his siblings, you know, you always talk to the mom, but you think it's all right, you know, because all oh, the kids are okay, but, but that really creates a disconnect. One thing my colleague or my friend told me was that, hey, if you want to get the kid's attention, do this way. Give them a video call. When you give them a video call, don't talk about those strict, strict things like, hey, how was school? Is your exam okay? Then you end it. No, 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 no. Talk about unnecessary things with them. You know, mm -hmm. the more you speak about unnecessary things with them, it, it makes them feel you are there with them and they always want to be with you. I have tried it two, three times and I see that if I continue, it will work. Because I mm -hmm. call, for example, speak to the kids and just ask them, hey, in your class, who is the most talker, uh, who talks so much in class? You know, those kind of funny, funny, funny questions. And I realized that, for example, nowadays, when I call, the kid will want to stay on the video call with me. Unlike previous, I call, say, hey, how are you? How was school? Oh, school was fine. Then, oh, please, I'm going to watch TV. Then they will quickly want to just get off the phone. But the more you talk about, in quote, unnecessary things with them, then they become kind of a bit closer to you, would want to see you, even if you are not talking, they just want to see you, just staring at the video, just looking at you, just like that. So maybe it's something that uh, some of us do, or we can also try it out. Then I, I, I really, really, really agree with Stephen when he made a point that we need to change uh, focusing on one person as the for lack of a better word, the connector to other family members. I think that also draws us apart. And so I think I'm going to work on that one as well. This is the little I would want to share. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard D. That was awesome. That was really awesome. Mm -hmm. And then uh, worth it. Thanks for sharing that as well. From my side, um, when it comes to time, the time difference, it's really a big problem, especially for those of us coming from West Africa. The time difference is so huge. You know, mm -hmm. the time difference is so huge. In cases like this, you need to, one has to sacrifice, even if it takes some few minutes of your sleeping time, some few minutes of your sleeping time, you need to sacrifice just to keep the family bond uh, uh, checked. Other than that, Children, family is, is everything that we, we, we all need. Because imagine you are in this world, you don't have child, you don't have husband, you don't have wife, you don't have siblings. You are, you are in the world alone. All you've got is friends. You have friends. Friends will never stay there forever for you. Those who will stay there, watch your back, make sure things go on well with you are your family members. And you cut ties with them because of time difference. I believe... Um, it, it, there should be a time that we, we need to make deliberate sacrifice, deliberate sacrifice. Yeah, deliberate sacrifice. I, <clears throat> looking at my country, Ghana, China, the time difference is eight hours ahead. China is ahead of Ghana, eight hours. So while the, right now as I sit here, <clears throat> it's now 9.30, back home it's 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon. They are in, the, they are in school, so I can't call, okay? The only time I, I can get in touch with family is midnight when I'm ready to sleep. So what I do is before I sleep, I hang on till I, I guess time them, maybe 1 a.m., 1.30, they're about, they are home or they are on their way. I can send a message, are you already set home or you're on your way? Then if I get an answer, then I, I, I place a call, you know, so the sacrifice is so huge. We shouldn't always look at um, the, 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 the stress it will cost us. But in the end, what are we trying to do to bring our families together? That is the most important thing. That is the goal we need to look at and then make a huge sacrifice to make that work. I don't know if Stephen would like to add something or 
to risk? Uh, yeah, well, in, in my situation, um, like for example, it's 9.30 in the morning where my parents are, where my family is. It's 9.30 a.m. right now. So for me, the time difference is, it's almost because it's, the time difference is greater, it actually makes it a little bit easier. Oh, because it's it, it, it can't get any more different. It is literally the opposite side of the world. Longitudinally speaking, Montreal and Shanghai are on opposite sides of the planet. So uh, for me, it's just a matter of knowing, okay, well, when I'm about to go to bed, they're about to get up. When I'm about to get up, they're about to go to bed. So, you know, the only thing is, is like, we can't, I can't speak with them, you know, during lunchtime or something like that. That's not, that wouldn't be normal. Um, I mean, I could, I just stay up and do that, but um, it's, uh, I, like I said, I, I made it a point of basically just, um, for me, it was, it was, I found that there were times in my day, my regular day, where I was sitting static doing, um, for lack of a better, lack of a better term, doing nothing. Um, basically like sitting in a car, driving from, from my home to, to this TV studio, from the TV studio back home. Um, that's that's a half hour car ride where I'm doing what exactly like looking at WeChat, uh, looking at uh, Douyin videos. Like, well, well, call your mom. You know what I mean? Call your mom. <laughs> Talk to somebody. You know, connect with the family. You might as well. They're just getting up. It's it's perfect. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they wake up. The first thing to do is talk to you. It's fantastic. Um, but that's my situation. And every family is different, and and everybody oh, comes from a different place. Very, you know. So, yeah, some people come yeah. from different places, but uh, to go back to Richard's thing is that that is exactly right. That the, the more banal you can make the conversation, the more interesting the conversation will be for them, and the more connected you're going to feel. Um, if if yeah. every time you talk to somebody back home, you're talking about being away from home, there's there's no upside to that. You know, it's just it. it you're you're much better off speaking about just you know, uh, world events, uh, Olympic games results, uh, football matches, whatever it might be, whatever, whatever you connect with your family with, whether it's a movie or a, you know, um, it doesn't matter what it is, just something that is not about you being away, you know, like just keep the conversation banal and, and very vanilla, nothing too spicy, just, and if you do that regularly, the, the, the gap starts to close and it doesn't feel like you're so far away anymore. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much. I saw Isioma. I hope I got the name right. Isioma. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, I want to add to Richard, what Richard was saying. I'm a child minister, though I'm actually running my PhD now in China. But okay. apart from the chemistry, chemical engineering, every other thing is on children ministry. One okay. thing that the children will always tell you is, my parents got the time for me. And you know, I would always tell my friends, if you're gonna start raising a family, especially having children, just ask yourself, are you ready to put 10 years down the line as a sacrifice? Because the child mm -hmm. wants you, so you're gonna give your time now, so you could actually enjoy the time later. Because mm -hmm. tomorrow when the children feel they don't have that love, they would not want to give it to you because they will feel disadvantaged. So no matter what, for us that are getting ready to be parents or are already parents, even if we are trying to make ends meet, it's better to have a balance. I may not be the richest, but I'll be able to give my child love. That's more important because exactly. that love is what I need tomorrow when I won't be able to get that money. But they will be mm. able to get the money and give to me and be able to give me back that love on the condition mm. that they did not miss out in that love. But exactly. when they've missed out of that love, it's very difficult. I've worked with teenagers who will tell you, my parents were not there for me and I feel cheated. And you won't blame them because they've made up their mind. It's very difficult to actually restructure the human mind especially when the person had a formative age that were not concurrent with what the society expects and the norms. 
it very go, it's going to be very difficult to train such a person. I met with friends mm-hmm. and we are discussing and they're like, man, I don't have a family. And it's surprising. They're just telling you why they don't have a family. They never had a bond. Maybe they were just giving back to, sent to schools and that, all of those things. So at least we should try to change such, even in spite of looking for money. Money is not going to stay. So if you get a level of balance, try to ask yourself, can I use this balance to give my child the barest minimum exactly. instead of trying to look for the best and end up losing the child? Thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much for that powerful um, submission. What are we all fighting for? Is the love from each other, love from parents to children, love from children to parents when we are all old. So that love is what is essential in the family and we shouldn't lose that of it. We should not um, chase shadow in the name of schooling. Yes, those things are good, but we should also make deliberate effort to, to, to incorporate the family bond to, to together, keep the family bond burning. Yeah, I would like to hear from Lalit Difa Kujo. Kujo, Lalit, you have any contributions to what we are talking about, family dilemma, the barriers, the challenges? What's your take? <laughs> All right. Um... I'm so happy our presenter actually realized what was lacking in his relationship with his family and has um, made commitments to make connections better. Actually, families are very important in our lives. And um, personally, this is the longest time I've been away from my family as well. at most every two weeks, I see my parents, my sisters, um, my um, family in general. So um, being away for more than a year, over three years now, is quite a bit of a challenge. But one thing that keeps me going, um, I think this one is more important to me than even the kids because it's difficult being away from them. Um, I remember at home once um, my second child had to go for a surgery. So I had to leave the first one because I didn't want him to miss school. We um, had to travel five hours. Where we were going for the surgery is um, five hours from my workplace. So I had to leave the first one at at my workplace and then travel with the second one to uh, my parents' place because that was so weird for the surgery and throughout the journey to my parents place I cried the whole time because I was leaving my son behind and here he was he didn't really like he wasn't really bothered like I was leaving because he had somebody with him but I was the one affected rather so for me being away from families um it's quite a challenge, but one thing that keeps me going here in China is the calls I make to them almost on a daily basis. Actually, I make sure I speak with them, I see them before I sleep. So for my sleep is always sacrificed. I wait for when they are back from school, we talk about everything from girlfriends to schoolwork to anything at all we just feel like talking about, we talk about. And then at the end of the day, I talk with my sister, I talk with my mom, I talk with my cousin, I talk with everyone. I make sure everybody gets their time. Sometimes different times of the day. My sister, I can get her during lunchtime at work. So I talk to her during the day. My mom, sometimes I talk to her during the day. Other times I wait for the kids to get back from school and then we talk. For my husband, anytime I feel like talking, I call (laughs) and then we go on. The same goes for my cousin. But talking with the kids, FaceTime is the most important thing. And that is one of the things that keeps me going in China. And I'm happy I made that sacrifice for them, actually. 
and I think so one thing we should also remember is we should keep them in our decisions. Mm -hmm. What I actually did was I asked them, mommy wants to school. She can school at home, she can school outside. These are the advantages, being here, being there. So think about it. If you want mommy to be home, mommy will be home. If you want her to be away for the school and then come back, she will go. But it doesn't mean she doesn't love you. She loves you and you are the center of her world. So make the decision and let mommy know. Mommy will go by your decision. And they actually took the decision for me, actually. I don't like taking decisions. I just left it for them to take. <laughs> and they took the decisions for me. That made it easier. So um, I guess I've had it a bit of, um, on the easier side, actually. <laughs> wow. Wow, that is awesome. Wow, I've learned something today. Actually, my, my kids are very young. They, they, they couldn't take that decision for me. <laughs> after the point I was coming. So I just had to uh, take the decision myself. And then they are now growing. So uh, they are now realizing that I'm not home. So I need to prepare and get home. Yeah, thank you so much, Lalit, for sharing that awesome submission. We are getting behind time we will take our last uh, contributor from sister k yeah her hands her hand is up Sister k over to you please okay can you guys hear me yes you're loud and clear okay sorry for my background it's a little bit dark here so i i really wanted to um emphasize one point that uh, Mr. Stephen mentioned earlier, because I felt like um, I felt um, like it ha it happened to me. It happened yeah. to me in the past. So this type of disconnection that you start feeling after living abroad for a, a long period of time, this type of disconnection with people that you left back home because I've also been here for uh, many years already and then since um, being here we have some um, if I can call it advantages uh, anyway in my case because here internet is very cheap compared to back home so here is very easy to access uh, international news things that I did not use to do, to be honest, when I was back home. So you have much more information about what is going on outside your home country. And this is something that most people back home, they don't, even if they have access to that, but they don't find it as important. So um, if I take just some example, like now the war in Ukraine and uh, the inflation all over the world and everything, this type of information. So when you are living abroad in a country like China, that is considered a, as a developed country, I mean, things like this are start to become much more important than the type of topic that you used to have with family or friends back home. So whenever you are calling them and chatting with them, and when, once they, they start talking about some of the topics that are very popular back home, but you, you are, your mind is already different. You find those topics like too, like backwards to behind, and you, you make this mistake that uh, Mr. Stefan was uh, talking about earlier like you do not you feel like you do not relate to them anymore like when you are talking even with your brothers with your sisters and everything and that is a mistake because at that moment you forget that you are in a complete different environment and you you make that mistake and um I think that what he also mentioned as a suggestion and uh, an advice that he's also uh, gonna try to, to use in the future, you have to take into consideration the fact that people that you left back home, they are living in a different type of society. 
in my, for example, in my country, it's the same as in your country, Mr. Stephen. Things are very stable. Things are um, almost the same. Even if after, let's say, three years, four years, when you go back home, things are all, all, always the same. So you have to take that into consideration when you are uh, communicating with your family, ask them how they are, what is happening in their life, what, what has have they been doing lately and everything. It's gonna make them feel happy and it's gonna remove this gap that create the disconnection. It will, it will remove the distance. They will not feel like they are um, thousands of kilometers away from you and it will make you guys be more uh, a little bit close closer to each other so um that's uh, a point i really wanted to to emphasize on because and i am sure many experts make this mistake as they have been living for a long time abroad they forget that it's a complete different environment so this is what i wanted to to ask thank you Thank you so much. It all boils down to, um, yeah, including the family, inquiring of how they feel, what they, they, they want you to know what is what goes on in their daily lives. So we also need to check the balances, weigh the balances, and then know how we communicate. Because you being in the diaspora, you, you are more enlightened even though they are, you are more like you are advanced in terms of news, in terms of social issues. So even when they try to bring old issues that you feel you heard, you've overheard and they try to bring it on board, uh, you just put yourself in it and then let it be the topic for the day. Yes, oh, this one I know. Yes, this is what happened though. Let them also feel that, yes, you, you, they, are, they are also in the line of light, you know, it shouldn't be like, oh, this one is dead news. I've seen it already. You you quickly shut them out. Yes, you and it make it makes them feel like as if you think that you are superior to them now exactly. that you are abroad. You've forgotten exactly. your roots. Your roots. Exactly. You've forgotten where you came from. You've forgotten the people who who raised you now you think that okay you are higher than them you're in a, at a higher position yeah all right oh wow tonight has been interesting uh, we've had an interesting discussion with our our presenter steven and all of us the beautiful ideas and suggestions we've brought on board the, the golden nuggets we need to uh, Lalit made it, made it clear that we need to involve the family, especially when children are involved. We need to seek their consent when we want to take any decision. And then I believe we've taken a lot of things. I have taken mine, and I believe you've also taken yours. So I wouldn't like to take too much of your time because we are far behind time. I would like to ask Sister, Sister K, yes, you. Just give us the closing remarks, then we close. So, sorry, uh, the is she living uh, Momo, uh, but I'm not sure oh. uh, he's here. But yeah, I think oh. he's still here. Yeah, yeah, uh, Chris, uh, yeah Christopher Momo. Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. okay, okay, okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Momo. Please go ahead and then give us the closing remarks, then we close. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Udi. Uh, thank you, our sister, for you know the spinner work done in terms of serving as moderator and our special and bigger thanks go to our presenter, Mr. Steven. Steven uh, much have been learned tonight, and also many of us, especially in terms of the topic, uh, traveling but not leaving home. And as technology has made it very easy for us today, now we can be any part of the world and we are still you know, capable of communicating with our family members and especially with our kids. You know, because of the love some of us got from our parents, even though financially they were not strong, but 
they were always around when difficulty teams, you know, they talked with us, they were able to manage anyhow to send us to school. Even when we came from school, sometimes difficulties in terms of finding food to eat that their presence were there. You know, sometimes they say, oh, you know, today is like that, but tomorrow things will be better. So if you have family who comes around you like that, so sometimes you don't even think about the, the challenges you are having because they make you forget these challenges. Like I remember when I was back in secondary school, sometimes it becomes very difficult, you know, for, for my, par you know, my parents or even get school fees for us. But my father would look me in the eye and say, because the way we were kind of close, sometimes he called me, bro, today things are like this, but tomorrow, right I show, God is going to make these, you know, things will be very, you know, good that you yourself, you won't be able to remember this story. And yeah. it was so much kind of like, sometimes when we, when we started, I didn't understand that as time went on, I started to understand what, you know, everything he was telling me when I, when I came to China and there was no way to go back home. Sometimes I miss these days, you know, the kind of time that we used to have to sit together to talk, you know, to explain things, how things are going on in the family, the challenges, and what we think would be the best way to solve this problem. You know, it was one time I imagine at my age, I had to cry. I was kind of like crying, and my roommate was saying that, bro, you don't have to do this, but you know, this memory, it helped us a lot. So those of us that have kids back home, you know. Like our speaker has said, and like our sister, uh, sis lady, I don't know what I'm pronouncing her name the right way, sis lady and that are sis K, you know, they are, they, are, they are right about those things. You know, when you communicate with the kids, and also sister Ruth, when you communicate with the kids, not just doing all your call, you know, like you have to make the sacrifices right now because your parents also made those sacrifices for, you know, for you. Like, uh, you, you know, they, 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 they deprived themselves of wearing the latest clothes and doing all the things. The little finances they got, they got it to send you to school, not only to send you to school, but they came around to keep your, you know, your company so that you can be part of the family. So we need also to do the same thing. Like it's a generational something, you know, but being that we are advanced and we are in the modern world, we should make it even quicker than they did because sometimes they went far era distances to, you know, just to find enemies for us. But even though, yes, we have traveled all of our countries, but we have technology that I made it very easy for us. So we should make it our businesses, you know, to always communicate with the kids, make them to see all on live video calls and other things. You know, sometimes you, you just tell them some of the funny things you hide, you know, going through your days. Oh, yes, today, you know, I, I ate chow fan, then maybe one of them kind of ask you, what you can, you can Yes, you know this, but you might think it to be not important, but the fee being part of you, because they see you on a daily basis, even though they can't touch you, but the worries, these letters, the, the communications you have become very important. So uh, I really, really, really appreciate uh, uh, Stephen uh, Rahat. I really appreciate your discussion tonight, and I just, you know, I just can imagine because myself, I, you know, I was kind of like a little bit lacking when it came to communicating, you know, with all of my family members back home. Like he did mention, I was kind of like using one or two persons to be able to communicate with everybody, like my father and my and my younger sister. That the other people that I, I, I found it very difficult, but, you know, having you know, express his own challenges and uh, later on uh, you find a way out to be able to solve it. I think it's a huge, huge help for some of us and especially our kids. And I want to thank him so much and thank our prof himself, Dr. OD, for this opportunity and, you know, for, for us to learn new ideas. Sister Ruth, I don't know how much I should say thank you. You know, it's kind of like... You know, sometimes we don't really know what others are going through until we have these kind of forums, you know, to be able to, to explain to us so that we can know each other challenges and know, and we can learn from it. Like to now, I've learned a lot. I actually have kids that they begin to, you know, begin a bigger challenge when, when the mother, you know, were kind of the way that I couldn't communicate with them frequently. So 
now I think I have to find all of means now my own duty to be able to find all of means whether the model is online or not I should find another means to be able to communicate with the kids on a daily basis so that they can be able to see me it's true that I'm not there but I can talk with them and I can be able to help no make them feel that yes okay my dad is you know our dad is around even though it's not physical yeah so I really really appreciate you Steven, and I appreciate each and everyone. Dr. Oti, thank you so much for this opportunity. And we look forward to seeing more and more of these things to come up, you know, because right now we, many of us, we are just kind of the focus on the education. We want to learn all of the book. We want to get all of the details connection. Yeah, but family is very, very important. Yeah, but sometimes we take it, you know, we take these things to be the least, but I'm so much grateful. So, so much grateful for this opportunity, Dr. Oti. And also, just a little bit of announcement. Today, the, the session, you know, tomorrow will be postponed because kind of like one or two reasons that maybe Dr. Oji will make emphasis on it. So tomorrow, there will be no session. So we can come back by Monday, the same time, 8 o'clock, so that we can have that other section. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who have been part and who have still been here until maybe you're about to close. I have Mr. C. Reiner. Once again, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Mr. T. Ryder. Thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> All right, family, we can unmute ourselves and just say hello, good, good night to each and every one of us, wherever you are, whether it's in the afternoon, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Yeah, Those yes. of us here. Well, what I would just like to add, yes, if uh -huh. okay. uh, yes, uh, some of these things we have learned please, you may write them down, you know, just your own expression or your own experience, write them down and you can send it to, uh, to us. Maybe let me provide an email. Uh, you, yeah. may, you may send it to, because so we can, we can uh, uh, publish it. We're gonna publish it. We're gonna have a booklet where all these things will be published alongside the speeches and the conversations so that we can keep it uh, for future use. And you will also send uh, along, alongside that a photo, a photo you would like to, you know, to be published uh, just side by side with your thoughts and your opinions. And it's gonna be circulated around the world uh, to see people can learn. I must tell you, I, you know, as many of these things have been going on, at some point, tears, you know, got welling up in my eyes, and it's this is real. And anyway, me, I don't know whether everybody values it that much, but for me, that's my own feeling, and uh, I, I just hope that this may also generate similar feelings for some for several other persons who are not here now, but who would like to learn. Uh, would have loved to be here, but they are not here at this time. So thank you so much. I'm going to keep, I'm just, I'm just typing an email where you can send it to, or if we're connected on WeChat, you can connect on WeChat as well and um, we share such things so for the publication. Uh, okay. Yes. So, uh, yes, please, our sister Ruth, you, you've ended it already, but let me just drop the email if anybody wants to send no something. Problem. Yes. No problem. No problem. Just quickly copy the email as you see it on the chat box. Yes. Yes, there now. Just right here. Do a quick copy. Then mm. we can just exchange pleasantries. Then we check out. Thanks once again, Steven. Thanks once again. Really, really, really appreciate. Really grateful. Really yeah. grateful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Thank you, family. And then we can all mute ourselves. From my end, it's good evening. I don't know from your end. Is it good morning? Good afternoon? <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay. So good night we can all unmute ourselves and then yes. we just wave ourselves good goodbye. Good night. Yeah, good, right, good night. Good night, family. Good night. That yeah. was awesome. <laughs> so much. See you on Monday, the same time. Monday, so see you on Monday. Monday night, everyone. The last day. So come with your families, your friends. And it's going, Monday is going to be uh, awesome because <laughs> the main theme is going to be discussed, the dilemma, the dilemma of, 
of, of the family dilemma, yes. yes. That's what you're going to discuss. So come, come one, come all, invite your grandparents, your husbands, your wives, your <laughs> friends out there. <laughs> Thank you. Until Thank then, you. it's bye-bye for now. Right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Right, good night, everyone. Good moments, and it's been a beautiful, beautiful conversation. Yeah. Uh, good night. Thank you, Dr. Odi. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're yeah. welcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. <laughs>